this is week six of the Introduction to the Cultural Studies lecture series and um, before we start today's subject that is family and marriage there are a few slides remaining from week five uh, that is the, uh, the body and uh, of course uh, the culture's reactions and culture's interpretations of the subject connected with the, uh, with the body. Uh, we have talked about uh, gender, we have talked about uh, <clears throat> feminism. There are uh, some more fields of study, so something that uh, uh, can be greatly elaborated on and uh, uh, all the subjects that I'm going to, uh, to mention right now, three more subjects in fact, uh, are at the very forefront of humanities right now. So they are uh, very uh, widely discussed, quite controversial at times and uh, they are part of very relevant discussions in cultural studies, in literature studies. Uh, and uh, of course, if we talk about uh, cultural studies for literature and philology, this is mostly about representation. Representations of various groups of people in literature, in other arts such as film, theatre, uh, popular culture uh, and also the ideology, the ideological interpretation of those representations. So what are these, uh, uh, as I said, three more possible subjects connected with the body? So the first one is a relatively new, probably the, the most recent of those uh, studies, called fat studies. So yes, exactly, it's about the body shape, it's about the uh, BMI, so body mass index, and uh, um, also the representations of cultural depictions and literary depictions of people living in larger bodies. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a relatively new subject uh, because uh, nobody really uh, cared before into making uh, larger people or uh, self-expressed fat people uh, into, a into a coherent group. But uh, if you think about it, there, there might be some group characteristics uh, connected with health, but also connected with social stigma and uh, social discrimination that uh, people um, living in larger and heavier bodies experience uh, in their lives. Uh, if you look at literary and especially film and TV representations of uh, fat people, especially young people uh, from that group, uh, it's usually see, uh, seen as a, uh, as a big problem, as a cultural problem, as a personal problem. Uh, there are also social movements connected with fat studies because what I'm talking about now is, uh, is purely the, the part of uh, philology and uh, literature studies and culture studies that just deal with the representations of this particular group of people. But uh, there is a, a sociological response uh, and uh, the um, uh, lives and experiences of self-declared fat people uh, have been studied as part of, uh, of the um, intersectionality uh, set of, uh, of um, uh, discourses. So uh, at least uh, two possible ways of approaching this problem from the cultural studies perspective. One is body positivity movement, the other one is fat acceptance movement, which are quite similar. They both basically um, aim at uh, normalizing the social existence of larger bodies and uh, promoting 
greater diversity of body shapes, for example, um, expressed in the uh, in the availability of clothing sizes in the, in shops, but also uh, the psychological well-being of people living in bodies of different size, either too small or too large, um, something that is not exactly in the mainstream. Uh, one of the uh, one of the um, uh, ideas and and uh, uh, points made by these groups is that body shaming is a normative social construct. It promotes discrimination. So basically, as with any marginalized groups, starting with women from the feminist perspective, just let people live their lives in peace and. Uh, do not shame them, do not discriminate against them uh, based on some sort of external characteristic. Uh, it is still a contested view sometimes, uh, surprise, surprise, because uh, uh, there are voices that it is um, um, against the public health measures and basically uh, that uh, uh, overweight and obese people should be encouraged to lose weight by any means possible. But if you know anything about the uh, the medical studies of obesity, it's uh, it's really counterproductive to shame people into dieting. It doesn't really work. It, uh, it's not the way to do it. So uh, this is this is a subject uh, uh, from the. Uh, threshold of medicine and uh, cultural studies and philology, so one of those big subjects that are very hot topics right now. The other one, um, not as uh, recent, not as new as fat studies, but uh, probably the most um, controversial of them all is queer studies. Queer studies um, talks about the representation and uh, experience of uh, people who are not heterosexual, let's put it this way. So the, uh, the group characteristics here is sexual orientation. So uh, traditionally uh, the letters used to describe this uh, uh, group of people were LGBT, meaning lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh, recently some more letters were added so you can find a plus so lgbt plus meaning other uh, groups marginalized on account of their uh, gender identity or sexual orientation uh, very often letters q i or a are added sometimes all of them meaning queer intersex and asexual so uh, if you don't remember what these words mean look at this uh, cookie person from last week and uh, here you have them explained. So these are the people who do not really really fit into the dualistic boxes of uh, masculine and feminine, of uh, um, male and female and other categorizations based on sex and gender. Uh, there are some scholars who uh, who are very um, well respected in this line of uh, humanist studies. Judith Butler, whom we have already discussed, is definitely a very important name here. Uh, her idea of gender performativity, so all the cultural baggage that uh, is added to the uh, to the sexual difference, to the gender difference, to the socialization of children into accepting socially constructed gender norms and gender um, based behaviors. This is a very important part of, uh, of queer studies uh, and uh, basically all queer study uh, textbooks or, or readers have some uh, some texts written by uh, by Judith Butler. Two more names of uh, literature and culture scholars. Both of them, um, and both of them, of course, uh, relatively uh, recent. So from the uh, from the second half of the twentieth century. Uh, the first one is Eve Kosowski Sedgwick. 
she was a, um, a literary scholar and uh, she basically was interested in 19th century literature, in Gothic novel and uh, classical um, English language literature of the 19th century, such as the novels of Henry James, for example. And uh, in, the 1950, uh, in the 1980s, she wrote a very influential book called Between Men, English Literature and Male Homosocial Desire. And she basically introduced to, uh, to human, uh, humanist discourse uh, the term homosocial. And um, this is a good moment to explain three terms. Homosexual, uh, hetero sexual, heteronormative and homosocial. Okay, so heterosexual and homosexual are terms referring to sexual orientation. Some people are attracted to the members of their own gender, it means they are homosexual. Some people, most people in society uh, are attracted to the, uh, to the persons of the opposite gender, so they are heterosexual. Nothing too controversial about that, except for some Puritan religious um, uh, concepts. But what is heteronormativity? Uh, of course, uh, as you can uh, probably observe in, uh, in everyday life, uh, heterosexuality is much more prevalent in society. Um, according to different studies, around 90% of people are heterosexual or mostly heterosexual, but the society as the culture and as people living in the society, uh, they um, make it obvious for usually for young persons growing up that heterosexuality is the norm. It is the normal orientation. So heteronormativity is the idea that being heterosexual is the normal way. So uh, whatever is not heterosexual, so uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender plus, this is not normal, let's put it this way. Uh, so it could be either a medical problem or a moral problem, or even in some cases a legal problem, especially historically when um, homosexuality was punished by the law. And in some places in the world, even right now, it is still punished by the law. So uh, the idea that heterosexuality is the kind of default way, normal way, the mainstream way. So uh, you have even in stories for children, in, uh, in uh, I don't know, uh, films, animated movies for, for, for children, you have always the romantic subplot and the romantic subplot is almost always heterosexual. I say almost because in the very recent years you have some very um, subtle ways of perhaps undermining this idea. But uh, uh, this, this is quite similar to gender performativity theory. So uh, the idea of enculturating children into believing that the normal way of living is to be attracted to the opposite gender which is fine for the 90%, but that leaves out the 10% who are not and cannot really make themselves attracted to the people of the opposite gender. So um, their upbringing, their process of enculturation will be completely different. They will even possibly do it at other times in their life as uh, heterosexual children. And here comes the third name, 
uh, of Jack Halberstam. I put the name Judith in brackets because uh, uh, this uh, scholar is uh, is actually um, transgender, and uh, the first books were published under the name of Judith Halberstam. Uh, the later ones, after the transition, were published uh, under the name of Jack Halberstam. So that's the same person, actually. Uh, if you want to Google this name and find the titles of the uh, of the scholarly book uh, books they wrote and um, Jack Halberstam uh, studies representations of queerness in popular culture uh, quite often not always but quite often these scholars uh, uh, base their scholarship at least partially on their personal experience because if you are growing up let's say far from the mainstream you may get puzzled and uh, and uh, stressed by the fact that the mainstream culture excludes you by definition. So um, one of the ideas introduced by Halberstam is uh, the, the concept of queer time. So we are actually back to the concept of chronemics, if you remember from last week. So uh, the linear, the concept of the linear time and the um, development of a young person into adulthood. Halberstam believes that children who are not heterosexual grow up in a different pace because of the cultural representations and cultural exclusions that they have to work their identity around. So um, it's quite, uh, quite a um, rapidly growing field of uh, humanist study and uh, quite widely contested especially in countries with uh, with conservative governments such as Poland right now so um, the treatment of these matters in Poland might be very different to uh, what's happening in uh, English-speaking countries. Uh, one more very important scholar uh, who is at least partially important for queer studies. But generally, his impact is much greater than just this area of humanities. Uh, he would be one of the most important postmodern scholars that have ever lived. And when we talk about modernism and postmodernism, we will return to him definitely. His name was Michael F uh, Michel Foucault. He was French. Uh, he was. Um, as he uh, called it, a historian of ideas. So uh, his theories usually um, concerned the questions of power relations expressed through language. And he is responsible for one of the most important concepts in modern humanities, the concept of discourse. Discourse means basically the way of speaking. like the way people discuss something, discourse. But in this specific use, it means the use of language for the expression of power. This was Foucault's pet idea. He, he spent all his uh, career writing about uh, institutions of social control. So there are, there are the books about the prison, the school, the lunatic asylum, and the way that these institutions were um, organized around language, around the um, expression of power through language, through the ways of speaking. Uh, towards the end of his life, Foucault started working on a, a large project which he called the history of sexuality. And um, one of the things that he wrote there, uh, because uh, um, he started with the uh, discussion of the Victorian society. And uh, he believed that this is when, historically, uh, sexuality started to be expressed through a very specific discourse. So started to be discussed by professionals. What kind of professionals? Medical, legal and moral, usually connected with religious. And uh, whatever was seen as non-normative, 
something like homosexuality, but also something um, like prostitution, for example, or other um, areas of sexual lives of people that were not seen as mainstream. There were only three ways of discussing those problems. The first one was the medical pro uh, the medical discourse. So something that was not normative was seen as a deviation, as an illness, as madness. For example, women who didn't want to marry, the spinsters, they were seen usually as ill or mad or um, gay men or married couples using contraception and wanting to limit the number of children they had. This was all seen as non-normative and so it could be seen through the medical discourse as evidence of deviation or madness or through the moral slash religious discourse. So this is something immoral, this is a sin, this should be condemned by all upright people, uh, this should not be accepted in the society. So persons expressing those ideas and uh, trying to uh, live the non-normative life should be banished from the society, banished from, uh, let's say, social contacts um, and uh, condemned as sinners. And in some cases, this was also discussed through the legal, uh, through the legal discourse, uh, which uh, basically had the law to criminalize unwanted behaviors and punish those who transgressed. I would say perhaps the most shocking example is the trial and impris imprisonment at the end of the 19th century of one of the great English writers, uh, Oscar Wilde, for being, heter for being um, homosexual. So uh, this was not seen as, uh, as a private matter. This was absolutely discussed in the open, but only through the lens of medical, legal or moral discourse. So uh, this can be seen um, in relation to various things concerning the body, but also probably other aspects of culture, especially those that are seen as beyond the norm. And the third type of studies I would like to add to the discussion of the body is disability studies. So the expression and uh, uh, representation of people living with various disabilities. So it's usually quite interdisciplinary. Um, it uh, talks about um, various experiences and representations in literature of people um, of people living with various disabilities, either physical or uh, mental disabilities. This is quite a uh, broad uh, spectrum here. It uh, corresponds to the concept of intersectionality, so combining different aspects of life, usually aspects that, re that uh, result in marginalization uh, of people who experience them through race, gender, class, sexuality, and so on and so forth. So this is the category of health and, uh, uh, let's say, fitness. Traditionally, uh, what was used was the so-called charity model, so people with disabilities were treated as unfortunate and in need of assistance. But if you know anyone who, I don't know, uses a wheelchair or has some other disability, uh, more often than not, they are very strongly against this model. They do not want to be pitied. They do not want to be... Um, protected by uh, by others. They just want to be treated as normal human beings and uh, allowed to express their, uh, their lives um, uh, freely. A specific 
example from culture, film, literature uh, that I would like to draw your attention to is uh, also from the 19th century, the so-called Victorian freak shows. Freak shows were like circus performances featuring people with disabilities, with various disabilities, usually physical. So they could be um, very tall or very short, they could be, uh, they could be large or thin, they could have all kinds of bodily um, deformities uh, and uh, as such they were displayed in a sort of circus uh, environment as again victims or performers. It's still a, a contested case. Here you have some names of famous Victorian quote-unquote freaks Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man, um, probably the most famous of them all. You may recall the, the classic film from, uh, from 1980 uh, about his life. And there were some more, uh, so here you have their names, uh, Charles Stratton, uh, using the uh, pseudonym General Tom Thumb. He was very short, he was a, uh, uh, a dwarf, as they called it then, and uh, he had a very um, successful career as a performer. And then the original Siamese twins, so conjoined uh, brothers, Chang and Eng uh, Bunker. Uh, and uh, the last one here on the list is Sarah Bartman, called The Black Venus. Uh, an African woman brought to uh, Europe in the early uh, decades of the 19th century to be dis dis displayed as, as the wild woman, as a kind of freak, but also playing on her, uh, on her race, gender, class as well. There was a film, The Black Venus, uh, if you're interested. Uh, and uh, the uh, lines, the um, fascination, of course, with uh, those abnormal and irregular bodies is still present in popular culture. Uh, if you uh, like uh, films and television, you can find uh, uh, representations of such uh, characters, for example, in The Greatest Showman or uh, the season uh, from 2014 of American, uh, American Horror Story uh, TV series, which is set at a freak show and uh, one of the ways of looking at these people and their bodies and their lives is through the lens of disability studies. So as you can see, so many things can be done uh, about the human body in culture and in a moment we'll talk about the family. So it's now time to uh, to really focus on today's subject that is family and marriage so something related to the body like growing out from our discussion of uh, of uh, cultural visions of human bodies but moving towards uh, the domestic sphere the domestic sphere is uh, very important uh, uh, for culture uh, you have uh, all kinds of uh, artistic, literary um, representations of uh, people in their domestic uh, spheres. Um, it serves uh, all kinds of uh, social purposes. The domestic sphere is uh, um, a shelter, a dwelling space where many activities take place. Uh, it could be seen uh, in, uh, in different perspectives. Here uh, you have a photograph of some, um, some African probably uh, village uh, with a, a rather simple um, shelter made from grasses or something. Uh, but uh, it can be any kind of domestic dwelling place. Uh, it could be, of course, uh, any type of modern uh, house or apartment or anything else that people use for, for living, either historically 
or uh, or nowadays so uh, what people do there um, of course uh, activities such as sleeping and relaxation preparation and consumption of food hygienic and grooming activities upbringing and teaching of children and sexual activity so um, this is this is what uh, very often happens within the domestic circle for the case of uh, marriage, uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, the concept of human sexuality uh, and sexual activity is uh, is probably the most important. Uh, and uh, if we look at human sexuality, it's always been a very important and also quite uh, divisive um, subject in uh, literature, film, culture. Um, for various reasons, um, one of the reasons is that it's dangerous and historically speaking it uh, used to be even more dangerous. It could be dangerous uh, psychologically, it could be dangerous uh, uh, for the uh, sake of sexually transmitted diseases or unwanted pregnancy or uh, all kinds of uh, social taboos and norms and um, is so if we have stories dealing with uh, uh, romance and uh, and uh, um, wooing and mating uh, behaviors of people uh, they are usually fraught with problems uh, what are the functions of human sexuality they are quite uh, diverse so of course uh, uh, it's biological reproduction but uh, then uh, that are uh, very important uh, in the contemporary world, probably even uh, more important functions of physical pleasure, emotional acceptance and reassurance and bond formation. Uh, in terms of uh, relationships and marriage, uh, the last one, bond formation, would be probably the most important. Uh, humans, uh, as uh, scholars say, uh, are the sexiest species on earth and uh, uh, not only because we are all humans and uh, we uh, usually find some uh, some uh, representatives of our own species to be sexually attractive uh, but also humans are the only species that have no breeding season so there is no mating season like most animals most mammals have uh, have that it's only one time uh, a year or a few times a year when they are uh, even interested in sex uh, humans uh, tend to be preoccupied with sex all the time or most of the time especially uh, young humans uh, especially humans who are uh, not yet um, settled into a, a stable relationship so they are at the uh, at the moment of choosing a potential life partner uh, so the psychological uh, preoccupation with sex can be quite uh, quite intense uh, and also there is the increased separation of hedonistic and reproductive aspects of sex um, and uh, um, one of the greatest uh, reasons for that is of course the invention of contraception and uh, if you remember from history uh, the um, effective contraception so the contraceptive pill was uh, uh, popularized only in the 1960s so anything that happened before was much more dangerous in terms of uh, of uh, the threat of unwanted pregnancy which was especially um, a big problem for unmarried women um, also we may think about uh, the development of medicine in general and antibiotics and the reduced but not completely obliterated danger of, uh, of venereal diseases but uh, uh, then again it all adds to the increasing uh, separation of hedonistic and reproductive aspects of sex. Another uh, way of uh, looking at this separation is uh, the presence of pornography. So um, some sort of vicarious, so kind of not, uh, not uh, uh, let's say, um, immediate uh, 
expression of sexual desire and sexual gratification so something that uh, is part of uh, of human culture and probably has been uh, part of uh, human culture for as long as it uh, existed uh, so um, there is an immense amount of cultural variation connected with uh, forms of uh, sexual relationships and uh, forms of culturally sanctioned uh, um, relationships, especially forms of marriage and the social expectations and uh, the questions of uh, the proper age and uh, a very important uh, question of who chooses the potential life partner. So uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit, um, but um, uh, the first thing you need to remember is that these things although they are of course uh, present in all cultures, they can be very different and uh, they differ um, synchronically and diachronically. So in different times and in different places uh, on earth, they could be very, very different. And each time the culture would say this is normal, this is moral, this is uh, uh, the way it should be and this is this is something that they would teach to their children. So uh, let's look through um, a few words concerning forms of marriage. So uh, for example endogamy and exogamy. Endogamy means marrying within uh, your own social group. It could be any kind of group. It could be a nation, it could be social class, it could be local community, uh, it could be even extended family, it could be a religious group. So marrying within one's group, choosing a partner uh, from the members of your own group, however you understand the group, is called endogamy. Exogamy means marrying outside one's group. So for example, the idea that uh, it's the foreigners that make best partners because, I don't know, for example, their genes are more, most different than, than yours. So there is a relatively lower possibility of uh, mutation of genes. But uh, uh, some cultures prefer that. Um, however, probably most cultures would prefer endogamy. So marrying within one's group, uh, at least to some extent. Uh, then we have uh, the question of how many people form a marriage. So monogamy means one spouse exclusively and for life. So uh, that's the classical definition of monogamous marriage. One wife, one husband or one spouse, let's say, uh, exclusively and for life. There is a concept of serial monogamy. It means uh, one spouse at a time, but remarriage is uh, possible and even encouraged. Uh, it could be remarriage after the death of one of the spouses or divorce more often. Uh, so quite many uh, cultures uh, in the uh, West right now um, seem to be practicing serial monogamy. So one spouse at a time, but, uh, but uh, you are free to divorce uh, if you are not happy within your marriage and then remarry. And of course, in case of um, widowhood, the um, widow or widower can remarry as well. Then there are different forms of polygamy. Polygamy means many spouses at the same time. Uh, it's usually uh, many spouses uh, of one gender versus one spouse of another gender. So it could be a polygyny, one husband, many wives. This is the more common version of polygamy. Or in some very rare cases, polyandry. Polyandry means one wife and many husbands. Uh, if we look at uh, um, different uh, cultures historically, um, polygyny uh, was or even has been practiced uh, by uh, some Muslim groups, by uh, 
at least historically by the Mormons in, uh, in America. The idea was uh, one husband, many wives, mostly to ensure a uh, higher reproduction rate. So, of course, uh, one husband can make many women pregnant and uh, uh, to have one wife and many husbands would still result in one baby. So, um, that's usually the, the reason behind it. Although, historically, for example, in some uh, Indian communities, uh, there were instances of polyandry as well. Uh, another uh, form of marriage is uh, child marriage. One or more spouses are children. Uh, so this is something that's not uh, accepted in the, in the Western world but is still practiced in some cultures. Uh, so here we have um, some images of um, married uh, couples or groups of people or ceremonies concerning marriage. So a traditional Christian church wedding with a bride wearing a white dress and a veil performed uh, in a church uh, by a priest uh, with uh, uh, the, the witnesses. Then we have uh, uh, a photograph showing a Muslim man and his four wives. Then we have a ceremony from India. Uh, so the husband performing some ritual on his bride and uh, the last one is <clears throat> as you can see a, a photograph of two men uh, with the not just married so uh, to indicate that uh, many uh, modern countries allow same-sex marriage you'll have the map later on so it's also part of the broad category of marriage why do people marry that's that's a big question uh, which uh, you may end up asking yourself I don't know maybe perhaps some of you are married you're grown up you're um, legally mature you could do it if you wanted to and uh, I wonder if any of you are married or uh, are you considering marriage and if so why? What are your motivations? And here I listed some possible motivations that people uh, that people give or they have given um, historically. Uh, as Bronisław Malinowski, one of those um, early anthropologists, 19th century anthropologists we have discussed, uh, uh, once wrote, marriage is the licensing of parenthood. So uh, the reason that uh, most cultures practice marriage is to ensure that uh, somebody will be responsible for the children and especially the man will be responsible for the children born to his wife. Uh, so uh, to ensure legitimacy and um, parental care uh, towards the children. We'll talk about, uh, uh, about child rearing and, and parenting next week from the cultural perspective so you'll see uh, that but there are other reasons like uh, companionship romantic love it's basically the relationship between two or as you can see uh, sometimes more people uh, for many people uh, the wedding is still a beautiful ceremony they want to uh, they want to take part in this uh, expression of their uh, love towards their partner this is something that some people do for the uh, family and friends to make it <clears throat> obvious that it's now a serious matter. It's, it's at least uh, in the intentions going to be a serious relationship. Uh, another very popular type of reasons is um, the uh, religious reasons. So most religions consider uh, premarital sex or extramarital sex immoral so to have moral sexual relations you need to marry uh, there are the notions of fornication and adultery meaning either premarital sex when both of the uh, of the um, partners are not married but also not married to one another and adultery when one of the partners is married to someone else 
uh, than the one that they have sex with. So uh, also it is a very important social institution which helps in establishing networks of kinspeople, uh, networks for trade, for security, of course, from the historical perspective it, uh, it was even more important than now, but for many people to have uh, large uh, networks of um, in-laws and, uh, and other kin brought by the spouse is an important thing. As I said already, legitimate offspring. So um, the questions of inheritance, either through the uh, father's uh, lines of matrilinearity or through the mother's line, matrilinearity, uh, it's all dependent on uh, how well you can ensure that uh, uh, the parents of the children are actually the people they are going to inherit from. Also uh, legal and financial reasons, joint taxation, community, uh, community property, medical information, inheritance, these things are much easier if you are married. Uh, if not, many legal systems just treat uh, um, partners as strangers so in case of any problems like the you know, medical emergency or uh, or um, buying a house together it is uh, much more difficult and much more costly if you are not married so there are basically legal and financial reasons. Uh, if in many cultures historically there was also money involved in the very um, in the very ceremony or the very um, organization of marriage. So there was some sort of compensation. Somebody brought in the money. It was either the bride who had to bring the money with her in, uh, in, for, in the form of dowry uh, when she entered the family of the husband, or it was the husband the bridegroom who had to actually pay compensation to the family of the bride in the form of bride price for taking away their daughter. Uh, it's no longer practiced in our culture but there are still many cultures that have it and as you can see it's purely um, social construction so it's not even agreed upon who should pay whom. Is it uh, the family of the bride to the family of the bridegroom or the family of the bridegroom to the family of the bride? It depends on the culture. Um, and generally speaking, uh, this question, the question of marriage and family life, have been uh, fascinating uh, scholars, anthropologists, uh, historians, uh, ever since the beginning of history and anthropology. So. Uh, and two names of 19th century scholars who are very important in the study of uh, family life, although their um, findings have been contested, um, many uh, modern contemporary scholars say they were just making it up because it kind of um, sounded interesting, but uh, there is no corroboration of these facts in, in archaeology, for example, but then again, uh, this is at least the beginning of the, dis uh, of the discussion that has not yet even been concluded. So the first name is a Swiss anthropologist from the, uh, from the 19th century, Johann Jakob Bachofen, and uh, his um, most important book called Das Mutterrecht, which means mother right, uh, in which he postulated that the very original human societies, Neolithic um, human societies, were basically matriarchal. So uh, they were run by women, that it was the women who were in the position of power. Uh, he, uh, he was one of those armchair anthropologists like, uh, like Fraser, the one who wrote The Golden Bow. So uh, he... Um, just uh, wrote about ancient societies and uh, observed some art uh, which was discovered, not much was discovered then, but then uh, again something was like the images of Neolithic uh, 
women, the so-called Venus figures, here you have one of them. Um, but there are very many and uh, many, many more uh, have been discovered since the 19th century. So those, uh, those uh, are powerful, usually quite large-bodied women that are sometimes called Venus figures and uh, they were uh, associated, at least by Bahofen, with matriarchy, with the um, belief in the uh, magical powers of women, magical uh, for the uh, for the people of, of the Neolithic period because women could bring forth children so they could create life like uh, like goddesses really. So uh, according to Bahav and the original uh, human society was uh, communistic and polyamorous so there was no uh, exclusivity, no marriage as such. He uh, connects it with the uh, image of uh, of the ancient goddess Aphrodite and then with the beginning of agriculture and mystery cults it's like the goddess Demeter takes over so uh, the, uh, the human community settle down and they start uh, uh, to, uh, to um, grow crops and then gradually uh, the cult of the matter is uh, is uh, replaced with more uh, cults of masculine gods, Dionysus or Apollo. Uh, so culture becomes masculinized, and uh, uh, eventually it's the patriarchy, the rule of men, the rule of the powerful men that replaces the women. Um, it has inspired many scholars, um, Louis Henry Morgan, Joseph Campbell. The feminists in the 70s loved it because this uh, um, really indicated that uh, the, uh, the right of the mother was uh, before the right of the father. And also one uh, scholar which you may remember uh, from completely different uh, context, that is Friedrich Engels. Friedrich Engels, an English-German uh, philosopher and industrialist and the best friend of Karl Marx, uh, who probably wrote uh, many of, uh, of texts attributed to Marx today because he knew English much better. His family has been in England um, much longer. So uh, one of the uh, things that he was interested in was family and uh, he wrote a book on the origins of family, private property and the state in 1884. In, and this is one of the very first uh, scholarly books on family economics, so production, distribution and division of labor, like who worked and does it mean that the people who worked had the power. So um, he was inspired by Bachofen, so he was inspired with this idea of the matrilinear clan. Uh, so some sort of primitive communism, and of course, being the best friend of Karl Marx, he was all uh, uh, fascinated with the idea of communism, working together, raising children together, not having any sort of uh, um, exclusive um, relationships. But then uh, he believed that uh, things started to change, first of all, uh, the incest taboo was introduced, so the sexual relations between people who are genet uh, uh, genet uh, they were kins people, so they were they were family. Um, genetically, they were family. Uh, was uh, made uh, taboo because of the possibility of uh, of uh, uh, mutations of genes. Uh, so uh, gradually. Polygamy was still practiced, so people had many partners, but female fidelity was increasingly guarded because of the concept of uh, child leg legitimacy and inheritance. So basically uh, what uh, in his view happened is that uh, the man's economic advantage led to the introduction of the pi patriarchy. So women were more or less, we might say, responsible for breeding, for bringing forth children to the community, but men started monopolizing um, labor and uh, property. And because if you have property, you want your family to inherit it, uh, they started to, uh, to guard the fidelity of women to ensure legitimate offspring. And this is how uh, patriarchy started according to Engels elaborating on uh, on the works of Bachofen. And uh, the last uh, name uh, 
and we're going to spend uh, some more time with uh, this scholar, Lawrence Stone, and his very influential book from the 70s, The Family, Sex and Marriage in England, between 1500 and 1800. Uh, so, um, uh, in the second half of the, of the 20th century, different ways of studying family developed. First of all, the demographic approach, studying facts from censuses, from church re registers, so uh, the facts about marriages, deaths, uh, burials, christenings. Then there was the sentiments approach, and Lawrence Stone is one of the main representatives of the sentiments approach, so studying documents cultural documents, letters, diaries, objects, such as house plants, clothes, utensils, toys, and of course works of art, such as portraits of sculptures and literature, so representations. This is something that will be of course most important for us and most interesting for us as philologists. There are some potential problems with this idea, so the sources are often subjective and not very reliable. If somebody is writing a letter, they might be censoring what they think. If uh, um, somebody is posing for a portrait, it may be flattering. Uh, literature may be a work of fantasy of the author rather than the depiction of reality, even if it, if it's uh, um, pretends to be realistic and of course most materials concern the richest sections of the society so all the uh, the physical things like the clothes and toys and the utensils and works of art usually concern only the rich so um let's continue so uh let's talk about the history of the Western family, the models of the Western family. And uh, before we uh, look at particular models, um, one more concept, the concept of coverture. So it's a legal concept that the husband should provide protection for his wife. Uh, the uh, legal words used for that were femme sol and femme covert. It's a kind of version of French. Uh, used in English legal system, which means uh, which means a uh, um, single woman and a married woman, so a woman who has this coverage, the protection of the man, uh, and uh, this has been the the backbone of uh, of uh, the legal system concerning marriage in uh, in uh, England uh, for centuries. Uh, of course, uh, women have always been at the disadvantage. Uh, and this is best summed up by, uh, by a quotation here from one of the judges from late 18th century. Uh, and uh, he said, by marriage, husband and wife are one person. And this person is the husband. Uh, so the husband was responsible for the wife, but uh, basically he could decide about anything. He could decide about everything that happened in the family. So the wife could not own property, she could not sign legal documents, uh, she could not obtain education against her husband's wishes. Uh, if she worked for money and she received salary, she couldn't keep the money for herself, it belonged to the husband. Uh, she couldn't decide where to live, it was the husband's decision. Uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, in case of separation, she was not even able to keep her children. So um, as you can see, uh, this uh, uh, concept of coverage and protection was very, very, um, could be difficult for women especially if the marriage was not a happy one. Of course, if it was, it, they probably didn't notice it, but if it wasn't happy, it could bring many problems. In return, the wife didn't have to testify at court against her husband, and he was responsible for her debts, so whatever she bought, she, he had to pay. Uh, according to Lawrence Stone, modern family, so um, a kind of family that uh, he uh, could sympathize with, so he could identify mentally as something resembling the family uh, types in the, uh, in the 20th century when he was, when he was writing the book, uh, was established uh, by uh, the British upper and middle class in the middle of the 18th century. And uh, there were several um, 
aspects of life, of private life that influence the development of the modern family, such as intensified effective bonding at the expense of kin and neighbors. So people started to rely on the, uh, on the immediate family, on the nuclear family, rather than the extended family. The sense of autonomy, the pursuit of personal happiness, this is the legacy of the, uh, of the Enlightenment. People started to treat themselves and others as individuals rather than predominantly members of the group. The weakening association of sexual pleasure with sin and guilt. So gradually and slowly the Puritan religious thinking was replaced by more uh, liberal ways of thinking and the growing desire for personal privacy. Uh, this led to dramatic changes, the changes in human psychology really, uh, the uh, questions that were never asked in previous generations and uh, that uh, still could be asked if you, if you uh, think about it. So if we look at questions like, for example, marriage for property, not love, is no better than prostitution, or sex without love is immoral, or personal happiness is the most important thing in life. The answers to these and similar questions could be very different in various historical moments, even in our own, that is, Western culture. So uh, it's not part of the human nature. It's definitely culture working on the backbone of nature and adding so much that nature is hardly visible. So uh, if we uh, think of historical forms of family life, the answers to these and similar questions could be completely different and taken for granted, taken as something absolutely obvious. Like marriage for property, not love, is no better than prostitution. What do you mean? You should never marry for love. Love should develop after the wedding. Uh, if you are in love, it will pass and you will be unhappy later. So people should not choose their own spouses. It should be left for the family to choose. They know better. They love you. They want the best for you. They will choose somebody um, to, uh, to protect you. So this sort of thinking, this was not shocking. This was absolutely normal. And it was rather shocking to think about marrying for love. So what we have are um, some forms of historical family life in England. Most of them are based on, uh, uh, on um, Stone's book. So the open lineage family, the restricted patriarchal nuclear family, the closed domesticated nuclear family, this is where he finishes his book, and uh, the Victorian family which came later and uh, could be seen as, uh, as something different than the modern family right now. So let's look very quickly at these types of family. So the open lineage family is uh, from the time of the Tudors, if you think about that. Think of the Tudors, think of the family of uh, Henry VIII, although perhaps it's not the best example, but uh, the people living in the times of Henry VIII and uh, people living in the times of Elizabeth I, so the uh, 16th century. Of course, these uh, types of marriage did not develop and uh, disappear quickly. They developed over generations and in some families they could last longer than in others, but there was always a dominant model. So what we are going to talk now is the dominant models. So the open lineage family, the Tudor family, let's, let's call it. External influences, extended family, local community. So the family is part of the local group and the influence on the people forming the family is exerted by the local group. Uh, preoccupation with property and status, of course. Strong class endogamy, so marrying within your own social class. Marriages were arranged by families. Sure, 
You wouldn't leave it to young people to choose their life partners it, if it was all about property, status, money. Uh, so, for example, rich widows would be valuable. If a woman married and uh, then her husband died, she inherited the money. So, uh, of course, she would find another husband, probably someone slightly poorer than herself who would like to improve his status. But rich widows were very valuable. Remote relationships between spouses, also parents and children. Uh, because if it's all a transaction, if it's all some sort of business, it's not about emotions. So you basically, you have to do what you have to do. You have to marry somebody, you have to go through the ceremony, you have to have sex with them, you have to have children together, and then to position those children for the benefit of the family. And that's it. Not really a very loving environment and nobody expected it to be the loving environment. Then what we have is the 17th century, so the restricted patriarchal nuclear family. And think of the times of the Stuarts, especially the Puritans, the uh, Protestant families from the time of Oliver Cromwell. So very strict, very religious, uh, there are some changes though and some, uh, some important uh, differences compared to uh, the open lineage family which goes back way to, I don't know, feudal times if you think about that in some aspects. So the restricted patriarchal nuclear family, the Stuart family, the Puritan family. Focus on the nuclear family, distant kin is less important. So there is a gradual lowering of the uh, of the outside impact on the family. Protestant religion, especially Puritanism, was absolutely paramount and it dictated everything about private life, including family matters. Um, this was especially visible during the time of the Civil War, which actually divided families. So you, ha you could have situations, and these were not rare situations, of cousins fighting against cousins or even brothers or sons and fathers fighting against each other um, based on the religious and political views of the people. So this is really perhaps a warning sign to what extent political and religious divisions can, uh, can grow. Uh, there is a stronger role of the state in providing security. So for example, people are no longer allowed to have their private armies. There is a state with the army to provide security uh, if you need one, but uh, you cannot have your own private army. Uh, you are not really allowed to pursue private vengeance or family vendetta. You would be punished for that. This is the role of the state, to punish the criminals, to protect the people from, uh, let's say, sieges of castles or something like that. Uh, one of the ways of securing that is through the growth of education, and through the growth of uh, humanist philosophy, which will continue to be uh, an important aspect. Uh, this is the culture still based on uh, um, power and property and status and also discipline. Religious upbringing is usually, I say historically, but also in, in uh, modern times, connected with very strict discipline including physical punishment. So children were actually beaten. Even in the 17th century, students could be still beaten at the university for misbehavior or missing classes or not doing their homework. So um, it was a rather violent time. Then in the 18th century, we have the Enlightenment family from the Georgian period, if you remember. So, um, the impact of the age of reason, of the enlightenment, of humanism and uh, individualism. So the closed domesticated nuclear family, the 18th century, the Georgians, okay? So further withdrawal from local community. Again, domesticated, nuclear. It's just the parents and the children in their home. The neighbors have nothing to say. The uncles and aunts have much less to say than before. Uh, there is a new concept, the companionate marriage. So free choice and friendship. 
revolution. This is absolutely a novelty. The idea that young people should choose somebody they actually like, perhaps romantic love, the kind of obsessive romantic love was not encouraged, but friendship, solid companionship, shared interests, yes, that's the good idea. That's really the good groundwork for marriage. Um, because of the enlightenment, which promoted individualism and, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, there is a growing desire for personal privacy, individual bedrooms, or uh, the married couple not sharing their bedroom with someone else, like the guards, let's say, or servants. Um, the um, relations between family members become more personal and warm. The words like mama or papa, the first names between spouses. This is, this is now common practice. Before that, you wouldn't call your husband by, uh, by his first name. You would call him husband. And he would call you wife. Or the other way around. Uh, just in case, if you got widowed, you wouldn't um, have to learn another name of another husband. You just call him husband. So. And then, but in the 18th century, it's all about emotions. It's all about attachment. So um, it's visible in the letters. It's visible in the portraits. You can see the portraits here illustrating these, uh, these uh, uh, types of family. And uh, the one from, uh, from the late 18th century, it's more like um, caring and... Uh, and uh, really focused on the relationships between family members. Then in the 19th century we have the Victorian family and this is the family type that is originated by a new dominant social class, the middle class. The middle class that really starts to come into their own after the industrial revolution in the second half of the 18th century and by the time that Queen Victoria comes to the throne in 1837 they are definitely dominant. They dominate the media through the printed press, they dominate the education, the science, the Anglican religion uh, and even the law in the House of Commons. So uh, the morality of the middle class starts to dominate in the family life as well. So what we have is first of all the divided spheres. Men should work, women should stay at home. So something that is still um, praised by conservatives. It doesn't really go much further than the 19th century but uh, of course what the Victorians say is the, it is the, natu the natural order of things. This is the natural way of doing that. There is a very uh, strong moral role of the mother. The women who uh, are staying at home to look after their children are seen as extremely virtuous and moral. Um, one of the reasons is urbanization, so the growth of cities, more urban lifestyle. Uh, and also more involvement of state in education, in the protection against cruelty, in, as you remember from last week, some legal measures to ensure a better legal situation of women within marriage. And this all leads to the modern family, the modern family which starts, let's say, in the, uh, in the um, 20th century and especially is visible after the Second World War. So in the second half of the 20th century we can talk about modern family in the contemporary sense. What do we have then? The decline of the number of children. Contraception, of course. Um, informal cohabitation without marriage. So many couples decide just to live together, perhaps even to have children together, rather than to go through the legal ceremony or church ceremony of the wedding. Illegitimacy, so having children outside marriage. It's more and more accepted. There is no social stigma, there is no legal stigma against children born out of wedlock. State involvement is even higher than before with the benefits uh, for mothers, uh, the pensions for uh, people uh, retiring and 
old age pensions mostly, child care provided by the state. The urban lifestyle is absolutely dominant. Uh, most people either live in cities or they uh, spend much time in cities and this is really the dominant lifestyle. Uh, all the other lifestyles are seen as kind of secondary to the urban lifestyle. Religion is less important. This is a gradual trend that starts uh, ever since the decline of Puritanism, but by the mid 20th century in Western countries, religion is very largely seen as a personal matter, not something to build social life around to the extent it was before. And also women's rights and feminism. So something we discussed last week, uh, women's um, voting right and uh, educational and professional rights for women, more partnership in marriage as, uh, as uh, the result. And to end today's discussion, there are three, uh, three uh, more slides about some more problematic cultural aspects of marriage. The first one would be interracial marriage, and especially in America, this used to be a problem and this used to be against the law. So you can see the, uh, the uh, map of the United States and the um, States marked with uh, red were those that uh, until the 1960s made it illegal for white people to marry black people. So basically interracial marriage used to be in some places of the world like North America or Nazi Germany or South Africa against the law. So something very personal as your personal decisions about love relationships and marriage could be legalized in such a way. And there was a concept of miscegenation, this kind of historical word let's say, um, used sometimes in America in the context of, of these laws against interracial marriage, but not only against the blacks, also Native Americans. Uh, in Nazi Germany it was also against the Jews and Gypsies, so um, there is not really a racial thing here, rather an ethnic thing or, or a religious thing going on. And uh, uh, this is one of the uh, ways in which something that is more or less normal now was seen as aberrant in relatively recent history. Uh, then we have two more uh, maps, one showing the countries that allow same-sex marriage, so those marked uh, in uh, like dark, uh, dark um, blue or black uh, are those that allow same-sex marriage uh, and polygamy, that is the uh, the marriage involving many spouses, usually one man and many wives. And if you look at those very dark regions, mostly uh, the Arab Peninsula and parts of Africa, these are the places that still allow polygamy. So you can still have many wives there. Um, mostly in Muslim or some traditional African communities, uh, but not elsewhere. Uh, the last slide shows uh, the, uh, the laws of divorce in England, uh, which also changed dramatically, mostly during the 19th century. Before 1857, the only way to get a divorce by, was by an act of parliament. So each individual case of two people wanting to divorce had to go through the parliament. You can imagine how costly, how time consuming and how difficult it was. Uh, then we have the Matrimonial Causes Act, which moves it to civil courts in 1857. And uh, uh, by 1937, uh, men and women were uh, given legal uh, equality in this, uh, in this respect, so now, and uh, they still using this law, uh, you can get a divorce uh, in cases of adultery and reasonable behavior, whatever that means. It's kind of a vague phrase that can be, mean many things depending on 
what you need it to mean uh, or uh, two years desertion or two years separation uh, five years years uh, of separation if only one party consents so if it's by mutual agreement two years of separation is enough if it's just a case of one person leaving another um, you need five years uh, you might say it's more or less uh, normal in uh, modern societies but there are still places like Vatican and the Philippines that do not allow divorce so once you're married well Vatican is a specific case but the Philippines the, it, it, the Philippines is a very Catholic country this is this is why they still um, don't have the, uh, the divorce and Malta the island of Malta allowed it only in 2011 so um, some things that are completely normal and commonplace in one culture could be very strange or even illegal in some other culture. And next week we'll talk about uh, child rearing and uh, child socialization.